Good morning, everyone. So welcome to day two of the Gold Lab Symposium. I'm Yvonne Kobayashi, and I spoke two years ago at the sixth Gold Lab Symposium on uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and how we can all work together as academics, researchers, clinicians, in pharma, as well as, um, as uh, regulatory to move things faster uh, to the process of drug discovery so that we can get drugs to the Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients efficiently. So this year's Gold Lab Symposium theme is the evolution from the lab to the living room. So let's, let's think how to translate this big data that we heard about yesterday, uh, translate what scientists and clinicians do, and let's also translate social thought and the environment around, around us into global and individual health as well as health care. So yesterday we got started on this theme um, with the Colorado Longitudinal Study. This, this is big data, no doubt. And uh, we want to understand like, how proteins interact with their environment to create health as well as the social determinants around health and health care. And then um, how education and uh, your physical environment as well as access accessibility to health care uh, can influence your health. So to create equity and sustainable health care, we, we need to work together across sectors to establish these connections. And we need to make this the norm from now on. So yesterday we heard about if we can't catch fish, you know, we can't catch fish without going fishing. And we need to expect the unexpected and make this way of thinking um, a norm to tap into this innovative information. And we also learned about these microbes that take advantage of the environment to survive and how smallpox was actually used as warfare. And we learned about high connectivity uh, is associated with health and how the virus host switching system you know, relies on perfect timing and opportunity and refinement. This is normal. So what are we talking about here? Um, each individual person is big data. And so we need to tap into this. We need to share it. We need to be symbiotic. We need to be parasitic. Um, we have to look at it differently to understand it. We know there is more to the central dogma of DNA gets transcribed to RNA and gets translated to protein. And we know that this junk DNA that we thought of before is not actually junk. So this intronic DNA is actually transcribed to RNA that has specific functions and that's unique to the cell. And we know that there's more to then RNA being transcribed to protein, that <laughs> RNA can do a lot more in the body, and that there's epigenetic changes to DNA that the environment causes that can has, have long-lasting effects on your health and future generations. So how can we bring all this big data together and um, make it better for our health and health care for everyone? So, Leading into today's morning session, um, I don't know if you saw the title, it's Horrible Diseases and Good Sex. Now, this is something my mother would be really happy and it would pique her interest, so. <laughs> um, but, and so that's the point, get her attention. So our, our first speaker is Richard Barker, who is the founding uh, director of the Oxford UCL uh, Center for the Advancement of Sustainable Medical Innovation, which is aimed at transforming the research and development and regulatory processes to bring advances more rapidly and affordably to patients. Uh, Richard's latest book is called Bioscience, uh, Lost in Translation, How Precision Medicine Closes the Innovation Gap. Uh, to paraphrase from Richard's, uh, what, he talk about, what he talks about in the first chapter of his book, which I really love, is that we have this vast amount of information that keeps accumulating by the minute or even second, seconds, and so, uh, but all this is made possible with disruptive technology. But a better way to put it is more transformative technology. And to give examples of this, he, he mentions Uber is the world's largest taxi company in the world, but they own no cars. Facebook is the world's most popular media, but they create no content. And Airbnb is the world's largest accommodations provider, but they own no real estate. So all these examples are made possible by the internet, this disruptive technology. But it was used to quickly transform how we think to translate a tangible product to have it benefit and have impact for the customer that is cheaper and more accessible. But for some reason, bioscience doesn't do that. 
We don't make it fast. We don't make it accessible, and it's not always cheaper, and it doesn't last. So Richard will be talking about this. His talk is Bioscience Lost in Translation. So I present to you Richard Baker. Yvonne, thank you very much indeed for such a generous introduction. I don't claim any credit for that um, little uh, um, story that you told. I think somebody else did that. But it's, it's not a bad way of describing the fact that um, we are now in an information society and things move extremely fast. Um, they, I'm sure other speakers have found this. The, the idea of thinking for a year about what to say in, uh, is, is a good thing on the one hand and a bad thing on the other, Larry. Uh, but thank you very much for the, present, for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Meredith, for organizing all this. Um, you, you, probably everybody realizes that my, um, my title's stolen from this film. Um, uh, who's seen the film? Pretty much everybody, pretty remarkable, right? So there are two disoriented people miles away from home, uh, and they st strike up a conversation. So that, that happened to me actually on the way over here on the flight from London to Denver. Uh, and uh, I was uh, talking to a, a seismologist from Ghana, and we were having a really exciting conversation. And the, one of the stewardesses came up and said, well, you two know each other, you're traveling together. No, we just started talking. So, uh, she asked me, what, what is it I do? And I said, I transform the productivity of life science innovation. <laughs> she, she asked the, 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 the other guy, what do you do? I find gold. <laughs> so if you have to choose between those two <laughs> uh, ways of describing what you do, I, I recommend the latter. And it struck me after this conversation, Larry, that that's exactly what I was doing too. I was, I was searching, searching for, for gold. <clears throat> So I'm actually here to talk about a mystery. Uh, it's not uh, does good sex lead to horrible diseases, because I think we know that under certain circumstances that's true. Um, it, I'm not going to um, talk about whether microwave ovens can be used to snoop on people. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I think that also uh, is a bit debatable. Uh, why um, the country from which I come chooses to turn its back on its most important historical trading partner, that is also a bit of a mystery. Uh, what the FBI actually have in their file is another mystery, but that will actually hopefully be, uh, be um, <coughs> uncovered fairly soon. No, it's the mystery of why, as Yvonne quite rightly said, I believe that life science innovation is the most monumentally unproductive activity that the human species engages in. So do you want me to say it again? <laughs> it's the most monumentally um, unproductive activity that we engage in. Now, I don't, I don't say that because we're not doing great science, and that's, I think, really the key thing I want to say. Uh, we live in this era, again, as Yvonne said, of exponential um, uh, growth in, in, in our innovative capabilities. I mean, whether you think about smartphones, the kind of IA, AI we were hearing about yesterday, um, we're, exponentiality is all around us. And exponentiality is all around us actually in the science end of life sciences. So again, Yvonne, as you said, you know, we've, we've gone through this explosion of uh, techniques, uh, most recently gene editing, but all these things that we can, uh, in fact, uh, build on the underlying science has been moving extremely rapidly. Um, and uh, the, a lot of this is driven by this curve. So how many people have not seen this curve before? About six or eight. <laughs> uh, this is about the most popular curve in life sciences because it shows how um, the, the cost, uh, and actually also the time, but the cost of gene sequencing has been falling faster than Moore's law. That's the, um, the, curve, the inset curve here. Here's Moore's law, sorry, for the quality of the reproduction. But so we're, we're actually able to sequence uh, genomes now uh, faster uh, and cheaper, um, uh, and the, the rate at which that's changing is, is, is faster than Moore's law. Um, we're also, therefore, being able to conduct experiments. Now, you'll see a lot of curves very quickly like this. What, how many papers were published in the five-year periods? Uh, this is Google Scholar data. Uh, it's not hugely accurate, but it gives you an impression 
Um, so transcriptomics took off first. But now we have both exomics, the red, and whole genomics, uh, the green. Uh, and, and, and we're really piling a huge amount of effort and uh, money into all of this. Uh, and in cancer, which is our most uh, rich area of genomic activity, uh, you can see how quickly the curve has climbed as a result of the advances that we've made. Um, and of course, genomics is not just, is not the only um, sort of uh, tool we have. We have epigenomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, microbiomics, exposomics, and all of that is sort of finomics. And now we have uh, gene editing. And the only omics that's missing from there is the economics, but the economics have been pretty effective in driving this forward. Um, uh, epigenetics uh, really taking off. For those who are not scientists, uh, this is the control of the expression of the gene. Um, so I, I like to call uh, our genome not our destiny, it's our management challenge. And epigenomics and epigenetics is how we choose to manage uh, our genes according in their expression, according to our lifestyle, our, our nutrition, uh, and so on. But of course, to get from all of this knowledge of genomics to targets for drug discovery, you have to go to proteins. And, and we've seen a similar uh, rate of increase. In this, in this case, uh, these are kinases, which are used uh, as very popular drug targets, particularly in cancer. So that's been climbing very rapidly. Um, and a lot of the work that uh, many of you are doing, I think particularly of, uh, of work that uh, Simon Lovestone is doing in, in uh, Alzheimer's and, and um, dementia, we're getting very fast um, growth in the number of ways in which we can track at a molecular level what's going on in a particular disease and the impact of therapy and so on. Um, if we go above the molecular level to the cellular level, again, an explosion of stem cell science, uh, embryonic stem cells leading to iPS cells uh, and so on. Um, and we can actually track those cells, uh, individual cells, and how they move around, which again in cancer is extremely uh, important. And that has become an exponential growth. And if you go up to the organism level, the human body, uh, this is the rate at which MRI, um, uh, this is particularly DC MRI, dynamic contrast MRI, is able to show how the human body in dynamic um, uh, activity is, uh, is either exhibiting health or disease. But, and I think you can uh, see what's coming now, all of this exponential growth in the basic science. Uh, but the less good, good news is that actually we're not seeing enough translation into patient uh, impact, patient benefit. <clears throat> These are the numbers. About two million uh, papers a year published, so to speak, in biological science. Uh, we've had some recent reviews, The Lancet and so on, to say how many of those actually are reproducible. Sometimes only about 30 or 40% of the experiments that are published are reproducible. How much are potentially translatable? Um, so I think there is a limit how much you can learn about dementia uh, based on demented mice. Um, but we've done a huge amount of experiments on rodents. Uh, are they translatable? So maybe I've estimated here, maybe about 300,000 papers a year published research that actually is potentially translatable. Um, out of that comes something 14, 15,000 patents a year uh, in the biological sciences, which is a pretty impressive number. Um, how many products get into the pharmaceutical pipeline? And by the way, I'll talk a lot about pharmaceuticals, but it's not that different in other areas like diagnostics and devices. Um, something like five uh, and a half thousand. This is a slide that's a few months old. I now have, you have the numbers for, the, for last year, the number of FDA approved novel molecular entities, 26. These are, this is exponential attrition um, of, uh, of the science in terms of translation. Uh, and actually Jack Scannell will be um, uh, moderating this after, uh, this, the, the next session, has described this uh, attrition indeed as something that has been getting worse, not better over time. So again, these are logarithmic curves. And over an enormous period of time, not only are we monumentally unproductive, we are, it's getting worse. It's getting worse over that period of time. And therefore, there's real question about the sustainability uh, of this process. <coughs> so, why is this? Uh, and here we do a little, 
I do a little market research, if you don't mind. So if you th think in your mind uh, of what the real underlying reason might be that we're having such poor success in translating this tr exponential growth in science uh, to um, uh, real products, uh, real services that benefit patients. So I'm going to give you a list here. Who done it? So look down the list, and as I go through the list, I would like you to put your hand up on, on the thing that you believe is most important in terms of uh, this problem. So uh, who believes that the, the real problem is misdirected academic research? One, two. In this audience, that's two or three very brave people. <laughs> who believes it's flawed models uh, in the process of discovery, uh, product discovery. No. <laughs> You're getting ahead of me again, Larry, as always. That's pretty, there's quite a lot of people who, who, who believe that. Um, what about inflexible paradigms for the development of products? Ooh, now that gets a lot of votes. Um, what about short-sighted and bureaucratic pharmaceutical companies? I think some people are voting twice, actually. No. <laughs> Um, and what about conservative clinicians? Ah, a clinician, I believe you are, sir. The internist from yesterday. Yes, yeah, so, so conservative clinicians uh, don't get that many votes, but again, that, it was quite brave to vote that way in this audience. Um, and what about budget-constrained health systems? A few, a few. Um, unengaged patients. Couple of people, two or three. In fact, I recognize one or two faces as actually engaged themselves in this process. Or is it just that biomedicine's getting harder? Yeah. Uh, as Jack calls it, you know, the, the low hanging fruit has been, has been picked. But of course, you can, you can see where I'm going with this. Um, if we go back to the detective, <laughs> the detective story that I like the best, which is Murder on the Orient Express. Um, if you remember, Poirot uh, was investigating the person who was stabbed 12 times. And it turned out that it was 12 different people who all each had reason uh, to do for this person. So the culprits are actually all of the above, uh, which makes solving this problem really hard. Uh, uh, but how many gaps um, do you think there really are? And I have diagnosed, so to speak, uh, five gaps in translation. Um, and let me go through them one by one, and you'll see the echoes of some of the things I've said. First of all, are we in fact conducting enough translatable disease-focused research? Secondly, how good are we at translating uh, that uh, translatable research into candidate products? Then, um, how good are we at getting those products through the development and reimbursement pipeline? Gap three, ensuring effective adoption and adherence of those products, not trivial. And then this is the part that we're getting more and more excited about, which is can we feed back from the clinical outcomes and the other data that can be collected uh, to, in fact, uh, what our R&D priorities uh, ought to be. And so I think many of these things can be grouped under these five headings. So the first one, uh, insufficiently translatable research. And some of this may not be very popular, but there's really not enough understanding of the mechanism of disease. Uh, Simon and I had this breakfast discussion, if I, I recall it correctly. And basically, we have, have not a really good understanding of what's happening in the various uh, forms of dementia that we've got. And so therefore, it's not surprising we're as poor at getting therapies for it. Um, and that, that co co correlated to that is relatively little um, uh, animal models that could be helpful to us. And, and too much to, Me Too research, uh, the, the peer review process, which is actually endemic in science, can re result in a lot of her herd thinking. And actually, if you remember the numbers before about the number of papers published, um, although there is a growth in the number of papers that are dealing explicitly with disease mechanism, I've just picked out the ones related here to ALS, the red area, it's still a tiny proportion. So um, our funding agencies are actually not putting a huge amount of effort into actually discovering the mechanisms of disease. They continue to be mainly focused um, on um, normal human biology. 
And um, one of the problems here really is the complexity of biology. Uh, when I last did wet lab research, which was really f far too long ago, um, which is, is rather, rather blurred, but you, you all know, those of you who are in science, the molecular pathways, they're so complicated. And the idea that you can pick one target out of this, modify that target, and know what will happen uh, to the wiring diagram that's biology is, is I think, hubris. The second gap is really the translation into clinical candidates. There really are too few academics interested in this. I suspect that the academics in this audience are amongst those that are, because they come to uh, meetings focused on health and translation. Um, and there aren't, it's not surprising because there's a lack of incentive uh, in, in the academic community. There's a lot of mistrust across the academic industry interface. I've observed that from actually from both sides. I've talked about the rather simplistic one gene, one protein, uh, one uh, ligand hypothesis, and the lack of really good preclinical models, which is beginning to change, actually, as we get better at doing gene editing on in vitro cell preparations. So um, I like to think about this as an ecosystem. Uh, you've got academics who are driven by grants, papers, and the raising of money from funding sources on that basis. Uh, but they often have, too often have limited interest in translating those uh, into products and patient impact. And their view of industry is, thank you very much, I'll take your money. It's a little bit dirty, uh, but don't tell me what to do. It's um, uh, a tainted funding source rather than a partner all too often. And there are obviously um, many examples of uh, exceptions to that. Then when we come to this hugely expensive, lengthy process of development once a candidate product is out there, um, we have uh, a sequential null hypothesis model that's based on randomized controlled clinical trials for very good historical reasons. But that results in a process that takes eight to 10 years. Um, it's um, a closed competitive business most of the time if these are sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. There's pretty high attrition rates. Um, and uh, the regulatory systems are, in my view, still too rigid. And then at the end of that, we have products that are approved, but not, in fact, gaining reimbursement. Um, in many cases, because the companies that are promoting these products don't think about value until too late. So um, again, I'd like to credit <coughs> Jack Scannell on this. Um, here is the comparison over time of how R&D outputs which are largely these, you know, number of NDAs, number of NMEs approved, and so on, with the inputs. And again, this is a logarithmic curve. So you can see to what extent the outputs have lagged uh, the inputs. And that's partly because I haven't got time to go through the development process, but those of you who are involved in it know how it's a, it's a very complicated multi-year stage gate process. And success rates are falling um, at successive development phases. So that's part of the arithmetic that drives uh, the productivity uh, decline that, that I talked about earlier. Um, and even the late, well, in fact, especially the late stage uh, development um, uh, uh, phases are getting more expensive and um, actually less productive. I talked about the regulatory system. Um, the old way of thinking about this, which is still the main way of thinking about this, is a very sing sing singular yes-no decision as a result of having done carefully selected patients through a trial over a long period of time. Um, sorry, let me go back. Um, then you come to a point of license after which the vast majority of patients uh, are unobserved in terms of their reaction uh, to the product. And even once it comes out of that lengthy stage gate process, um, often approved products have limited response rates. And so too many of these uh, eff efficacy rates uh, in various diseases are less than 50%, uh, which tells you something about the match between the product uh, and the biology. Gap, uh, so gaps T1 and T2, um, I think will be very familiar to most people. I'm not sure many people think about gap T3, which is about the adoption and adherence to the products once they're approved. Uh, we've got a model, by the way, of how product adoption uh, works. It's a battle between company reps and um, conservative health systems. It's an interesting paradigm when you think about it. 
there's not really a, an engineering of the process um, of spread. <clears throat> the official number of how long it takes to between the appearance of a technology and the consistent adoption by the National Health Service is 17 years. 17 years? Can you imagine, you know, somebody comes up with a new uh, version of the smartphone uh, and it takes 17 years before most people are using it? But that's how long it takes uh, in the uh, English NHS. Um, and, and when you come to the patients and the patient compliance, again, we've still got this very old and odd model that people forget to take their treatment. They don't forget, and there's been a lot of interesting research at the UCL end of, of CASME on, on why, it's, uh, why it happens. Uh, and it's really about the way in which people think about their need, think about concerns about the therapy and so on. But again, there are these cultural gaps. Uh, and here we're dealing with a cultural gap between the NHS, as I say, the health system uh, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry, which is seen as a commercially driven entity rather than a partner in the treatment of disease, for reasons that are perfectly understandable, perhaps, on both sides. And then finally, and I won't spend much time on this, but this is really the, the, the area de jour, so to speak, which is how we can learn from the real world treatment of patients uh, for uh, the future of, of R&D. There's been limited deployment until recently uh, of electronic medical records, which have poor interoperability. Uh, providers are holding data still, particularly here in the US, they think of it as their asset rather than the patient's asset. Uh, we've got concerns, legitimate concerns about confidentiality and so on. And so as a result of that, we've not been putting much effort in or putting much credence on real world data as a source of evidence. And if I go back to this curve, you will recall that actually in the development, we're very carefully collecting data, but after development, we're not. Uh, after licensing, we're not. Um, and so therefore, uh, we, we, we lack all the insight that could come from looking uh, at post-approval products. And so we've got these cultural gaps, which I've been emphasizing, but we also have, um, so to speak, an organizational pass the parcel, or as Meredith told me earlier, is actually called pass the present uh, here in, in the US. Uh, because what we have is basic research um, that raises money and comes to a certain point, then either the same person or a different person becomes the applied scientist, um, raises money differently for, for, that, for, for that work. Then there's a spin out from the university. Then there's a venture uh, backed company. Then a major pharmaceutical company. And finally, the health system. And the, the innovation gets passed from one of these to, and the number of innovations that get dropped, uh, either because they don't work, which is perfectly legitimate, or because the funding agency isn't ready to hear it, um, is just enormous. You've seen what that looks like. Uh, there aren't many human activities with quite as much fragmentation in the value chain as that. And the result of that is it takes 20 or 30 years for things to pass through that. We are very pleased with what we've got out of cystic fibrosis recently with Ivor Kapler and uh, the other Vertex products. Uh, but actually, if you look back, we characterize the CFTR protein that it interacts with a uh, full 20 years, really, before the product came out. And if you look at Gleevec, I mean, I've got a number of examples in the book that I wrote, but Gleevec is another one where actually go all the way back to the, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, identification of the Philadelphia chromosome, that genetic exchange had taken place. As a result of this, you had this new protein, BCR, ABL, uh, and that underlay um, the, uh, the problem of, of, of CML. But again, you know, a big gap between that, the discovery of Gleevec, and the um, approval by the FDA. And one could take example after example of how we have allowed it to take 20 or more years. So what's my prescription? I better get on with what, what to do about all this. Um, I believe there are two concepts that are critical here. One is precision medicine, um, and the other is adaptive thinking. Precision medicine, I don't expect I need to take much time on this. Uh, really, the right dose for the right um, uh, of the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Um, uh, I, I once uh, made this presentation and the uh, British um, health minister uh, was in the audience and he got up after me and said, at the right price, um, which was <laughs> quite understandable. Um, and some of you will be familiar with these different forms of um, 
precision medicine, stratified, grouping people into very broad groups. Um, precision, which is actually, um, for example, looking at mutational signatures in cancer. And then finally, really personalized medicine. We see examples already, uh, predictive personalized medicine. I use the phrase precision medicine to cover all of those things. And actually, if you look um, at a particular disease like lung cancer, it's moving from being seen falling in two or three groups to multiple uh, different subgroups of cancer. And indeed, we're now able to individually fingerprint the colonies of cells in the tumor and disseminate it around the body. So it, this means that we can actually take a very different approach to the whole value chain. We can start with a molecular definition of disease. We can then move to recruiting patients for trials on the basis of particular markers. Then to um, get earlier approval via an adaptive route, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, then we can price for outcomes on specific populations. Uh, we can also then um, uh, enable clinicians after a product has been uh, approved to adopt via molecular markers. Uh, then we'll have digital tools to monitor the output and then an ongoing analysis and feedback loop. So um, precision medicine, which um, I mean, I guess everybody has heard about precision medicine. Yeah, I think they see lots of nods and hands. Um, this is actually, in my view, a very important uh, ingredient for changing all this, as is changing from this pathway uh, that we've seen before um, to uh, applying adaptive thinking, having an initial license being um, granted quite early in the process, uh, and then full or subsequent broader licenses, but actually tracking uh, the, the outcomes of patients um, all the way through this process. So um, I believe that productivity could be dramatically better. As I said, it's monumentally unproductive at the moment. I, I can convince myself, and uh, uh, written and spoken about it, that we could be an order of magnitude better at this if we look at these various culprits along the, the process and really take a, a, an effort. Um, and so finally, I want to stop, uh, I want to finish with a challenge to all of us to how we might couple these approaches together. Um, I, I'm working now on this new model um, of translation, which is based on strategies um, founded on precision medicine, has a more adaptive mindset, but also has milestone-based funding, and actually see if we can engineer the process rather than have the past the past or past the present uh, approach. Can we couple these things together? Uh, and we're doing some work in, in, a, in a Central Asian economy uh, trying to build this, uh, this way of doing things. And can we, in fact, also couple funding uh, to the milestones uh, that, um, uh, that are passed? There'll be a lot of things that will inevitably drop out as it goes through. Uh, but why do we have to have this period, uh, these periods where people have to stop, think, apply for money, uh, restart, and so on? Uh, so that's what we're, uh, we're trying to do. Uh, we've done some work actually at two ends of the spectrum, one in the Central Asian economy, the other in Stanford University, and there's lots of space in between. So I'm looking for opportunities to take this very, I think, quite revolutionary approach to how we can improve productivity. Uh, and out of this, I've um, uh, created with some colleagues a, a new entity called New Medicine Partners to, to actually do it. So I just want to finish very briefly with this story. Why do we do this? It's about patients. Um, this is a gentleman called uh, Cameron Lundfeldt, who was born to his mother uh, in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, he didn't thrive in his early, uh, early uh, days, uh, turned gray, eyes rolled up in his head. Uh, they were really worried about him. They eventually found uh, a doctor who said, well, this is type 1 diabetes. Rather early, but it's type 1 diabetes. Mother wasn't satisfied with this. So she went on the internet and found about um, uh, a girl called Lily Jaffe, who had been discovered to have a mutation in the KCNJ11 gene, which caused neonatal diabetes. And if any of you are diabetologists, you know the problem is insulin. The problem in, the, in that particular neonatal diabetes is that the insulin is made in the, the, the beta cells of the pancreas, but can't get out. And all you have to do is give a simple sulfonylurea drug to uh, that, um, in this case, both the girl and the boy. Uh, the insulin comes out, and, and just by taking a pill a day, 
uh, they can live a normal life instead of two or three times a day having to have insulin injections. And I tell that story because I think it's vital that we remember why it is we do this stuff and how precision medicine can make an enormous difference. So I, I find, finish with the gold, uh, Larry. Um, I think there's plenty of gold in all of this for patients, for, for clinicians, for health systems, and for all of us as a society. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. Thank you, Richard. Um, very interesting presentation. I, I just wanted to ask if I was about the future of where your research is going on this very interesting framework. Um, I particularly want to ask if you were thinking of quantifying the, the gaps that are there um, and the causality, because you've essentially defined a, a pipeline and the leakage in the pipeline. And I was curious about quantifying those gaps and then seeing if and how personalized medicine actually reduces the, the leakage in that pipeline. I feel like the researcher then says to say, well, you give me the money, I'll, I'll do it. Jack and I have talked about how you might do this. And um, I, I have to say um, that much of this is assertion based on anecdote. I had to catch Mark Feldman's eye. There was a point, point at which I moved from showing data to showing assertions based on uh, anecdotes, which probably means I could be a good politician, I don't know. Um, but you're, you're right, we could, we could look at these individual steps and say, okay, so if we could reduce this, we could reduce that, increase that, what could we do? Um, what I haven't got time to talk about, but we probably talk about later, is how precision medicine um, actually changes the whole economics of the process. So, uh, in fact, you know, drugs cost more, but they, they, they work for fewer patients. Uh, excellent idea. Um, apologizing to the famous Dirac story about a question not being a question. This may be more of a comment, although maybe it's a form of a question because you could figure out a solution to it. I see one of the biggest problems with precision medicine being the fact that there are too many different diseases that are different targets that have to be approved separately. So in my case, having started out in Larry Gold's lab here decades ago, uh, I've wandered into the field of gene therapy in the last few years. And one of our major problems is we're working on a very rare recessive form of a cardiac arrhythmia. Okay, we can do a gene replacement with A or B, that's fine. Far more common is the dominant form of that disease, but there are 200 different mutations in the population in that gene. This is a very common story in gene therapy targets now. Yeah, and cystic fibrosis is really and common. RNA silencing, AAV delivered silencing, gene editing, no matter what approach you take, every one of those mutations is a different biological drug that needs to be approved separately. And furthermore, one more comment, I was at a gene therapy meeting and there was an amazing talk, of course, about uh, immunomodulated cells for cancer treatment. But again, he was looking at neoantigens, he looked at 20 different tumors, and each 20, all 20 had a different neoantigen. And I'm going, the treatment's gonna work, but who's gonna get it? The President of the United States and maybe a few very wealthy people or someone who happens to work at an academic university uh, medical center. So do you see any way to deal with that issue? Yeah, no, in the limit, you have to, uh, you have to be right. It becomes impossible to uh, de design and, and, and cost and price a therapy that, that deals with a, a very, very tiny number of people. We've had orphan diseases as our kind of exceptions through the system, but the more, orphan, more we orphanize disease, uh, the, w the worse the problem that you describe gets. So, that's so that's an, it's another discussion for, for another day, but you put your finger on the really important point. Talk, uh, but I think the complexity is even greater than you've presented in the limited time, because there are a range of other factors which have to be put in. And say so one of them is social factors. Why do some patients volunteer for clinical trials and then they don't? So it depends on the state on the therapy curve. If they don't have anything to lose, they volunteer and you can make go up the curve. As therapy gets better, they've got things to lose. They don't want to try new things. So, so this is a, a built-in anchor that uh, is challenging. And as you know, a very large number of clinical trials recruit zero patients.
not a one. <laughs> and so there is a big problem there. There's another issue which you haven't um, had time to address, which is legal. You know, our wonderful lawyers uh, are a terrific br uh, break, drain, or whatever you want uh, on drug development. Uh, you know, there's a risk of being sued at every step in the process. Uh, we treated with anti-TNF an air hostess. She did very well, but she still sued us. Why? Because, uh, you know, she talked to a lawyer and he said, well, you've been on this trial, you've improved, but you weren't cured. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. You know, so, so, so it turns out that one of the biggest problems is that the legal framework for most clinical trials is quite flawed. In other words, you, patients sign a consent form, which now may be 60 to 100 pages long, but it's not a legally binding document. If they want to, they sue. This is not true for vaccines, for example. And the third problem, which is... Uh, uh, the monumental overarching issue, which you've alluded to but didn't have time to go, is economic. How do you choose which of very many permutations uh, get, uh, get, uh, have the opportunity to have this adaptive drug development? And I think we are pretty bad at all three of these aspects, as well as the five that you've, discovered, that you've discussed. So I think, I don't think we are going to accelerate progress in biomedicine uh, according to the principles of information technology. Um. No, no, thank you, Mike. I, I take certain comfort from the fact that you have actually battled your way through this process, so it can be done. I've got a lot of gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> so the notion that there is a path to a log improvement from 17 years to one or two will require a proof that it can be done in some setting. And the setting, ideally, will be the, exactly the next talk, although Carl's group may not be thinking this way. If you remember uh, Jack Scannell's talk when we heard it, the, the real idea was once you know that your drugs will not kill a patient, and that's early, real early, it's phase one after the first few months of a phase one trial. What I think he said, and I believe, and your talk made it more sensible, is that for rare, lethal, debilitating, awful diseases, drugs should go from a phase one trial into use in large clinical trials, I'm, I'm, I'm translating what he said into what I happen to believe, with care, meaning sure. monitoring, of supervision. observation of what you're doing, because the patients you're talking about are still six years away yeah. from a drug, and they should be invited without coercion into whatever you're gonna call it, an adaptive trial or not. So you have to pick the setting where the alternative to not being treated is an awful death. And I think when that, and usually, it, and it should be a child, you say, yeah. oh no, you're yeah. not gonna turn children. Yeah, DMD is a great example. DMD is a perfect example. And so the question we should all be listening to in, in the Carl talk in about one minute, if I would show I was gonna say a wonderful segue, this is. Well, you would think that the, the organizers thought of it that way, but don't, don't, don't think that. So I, I think that we ought to hope we can find examples where we're not thalidomizing kids, but helping them, okay? Okay, thank you very much. So our <laughs>